Welcome to Headline Buster, brought to you by me, Liu Xin, with The Point. In this series, I dissect stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to my guests to compensate for the missing pieces of the puzzle. So do join us in real time by sending us your comments and uh, questions via the CGTN page on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube or Weibo. If you're watching this live on the CGTN application, email me at thepointwithlx at cgtn.com. Let me know what you think. We start our live streaming every Friday at 11 a.m. Beijing time, so do get in touch and write me. And I just might read out your comments. Speaking of which, let's take a look at some of the comments we've received so far. Brent Sidney said, why can't you people just admit the pandemic first appeared in China? That's where it became a pandemic. It doesn't matter which bat cave the virus first mutated or whether it existed years ago in the jungle somewhere. The pandemic started in Wuhan in China. That's where the global outbreak became a problem. That's where it started in China. Okay, I hear you. I think that's the opinion of a lot of people. I understand that. But let us also be clear. It is true that the first cases were reported in Wuhan, China, but we have also seen reports from other parts of the world which pose very important questions. For instance, a mayor in the United States insisted okay, that he might have been affected, infected by this virus as early as last November in the United States. There have also been reports in Spain which says that wastewater samples from, this, from the city of Barcelona from March 2019 tested positive for coronavirus and other reports similar to those. So are we going to ignore all these reports and just make assertions or are we going to keep asking these questions and trying to find answers? It's not about politics but about scientific truth. Okay? Now the house that built Li Kuang the house that Li Kuang Yu built says Chinese vaccines have tiny spy bot inside, powered by 5G Huawei. Scott Morrison begging any country that has vaccine to release it. Don't trust spy vaccine from China. Um, there are people who also believe the earth is flat. Shall we believe them? Finally, Mr. Buddha Dribble Aid says that first of all, some have legitimate concerns about the, vi about the vaccine being rushed and that's understandable. Anything that is too rushed can have defects and that has to be, uh, that's to be expected. But when there are seven billion lives at stake, we cannot afford to take things slow. Time is of the essence. We have enough expertise and uh, the manpower to achieve this if we all come together and pull all of our great resources together and work together. Sadly, the whole thing with COVID-19 has been overly politicized when we should all be working together to find a vaccine. The more we work together, the quicker we can find a vaccine and the quicker we can start producing proper vaccines enough for everybody. Why are certain countries politicizing the vaccine? Well, in an ideal world, people work together and help each other, but the real world that we're living in is far from being ideal. It's the sad truth we have to deal with. All we can do is to push for positive changes and bust headlines one at a time. That's also why this week, as the world enters its ninth month of battling coronavirus, we want to go back in time to the early stage of the pandemic and revisit some media reports to see whether they have been fair about China's response. Now, nobody can predict the future, but some of these reports not only try to do that, but wanted readers to believe they had a real point. Did they? On January the 23rd, the central government of China imposed a lockdown in Wuhan and other cities in Hubei province in an effort to quarantine the epicenter of the outbreak. For 76 days, the people of Wuhan were in strict quarantine, while the rest of China also took stringent measures, fever checks, face masks, social distancing, you name it, all of these steps weren't fun nor easy, but they paid off. Now, earlier this month, Wuhan celebrated its victory over the virus by holding an epic poll party.
It made international headlines. Now, packed with revelers, the pool party symbolized how far the city has come and what's possible with discipline, sacrifice, and cooperation. China also closed in on finalizing its COVID-19 vaccines. Now, one vaccine has already been put to emergency use on high-risk groups such as immigration officers and healthcare professionals. And of the six vaccines in phase three trials, three are being made in China, according to the World Health Organization. After a hard first quarter, the Chinese economy has been on a strong rebound. According to a recent Wall Street Journal article, China is the only major economy expected to register positive growth this year. And J.B. Morgan recently boosted its 2020 China growth forecast to 2.5 percent from 1.3 percent in April. Economists at the World Bank and elsewhere have also upgraded their forecast for China. The U.S. economy, by the way, is expected to slide 8 percent this year. Now, even the hobbled China-U.S. trade deal seems to be moving forward. Top U.S. and American trade officials reaffirmed their commitment to the phase one trade deal in a phone call on Tuesday. According to Bloomberg, China's corn imports in July from the United States jumped to the highest volume in three years. So the picture has changed a lot over the past year, especially when you look at what some were saying in the media a few months back. Let's revisit some of these pieces and see how off they were. My first example, The Guardian, on February the 2nd, published an opinion piece titled China's reaction to the coronavirus outbreak violates human rights. The WHO has praised the country's response, but heavy-handed approach could make things worse. The article criticized the WHO for praising China's response to the outbreak when Dr. Tedros, the director general of the World Health Organization, tweeted, China is actually setting a new standard for outbreak response. The Guardian piece says the WHO is ignoring Chinese government suppression of human rights regarding the outbreak, including severe restrictions of freedom of expression and that the Chinese government can lock millions of people in cities with almost no advance notice should not be considered anything other than terrifying. Yes, the decision was hard, and yes, the people of Wuhan and other Chinese cities had made huge sacrifices, but now we see that the decision was, most importantly, effective. Not only was it effective, but it was ultimately necessary and replicated by many countries when they were faced with their own outbreaks. On March the 9th, Italy imposed a national lockdown. On March the 13th, so did Iran. One day later, so did Spain. On March the 25th, India imposed this national lockdown, in, uh, limiting the movement of 1.3 billion people, the largest lockdown in history, and the list go on. Countries around the world soon followed suit. So, was everybody violating their people's human rights? The opinion piece captures the sentiment of many others that criticize China's me measures from afar, calling them draconian, authoritarian, a violation of human rights and privacy. But when the virus showed up in their own backyard, they started to see things quite differently. What is it? Empathy? Putting yourself in the shoes of others? And this was just one of the many reports that were criticizing China for its violation of personal freedom, the human rights in containing the virus, yes, freedom is important, but saving lives perhaps just a little bit more when faced with an infectious disease. Of course, the criticism hasn't been limited to China's measures to fight the virus. Who could forget the February 3rd opinion piece published by the Wall Street Journal titled China is the real sick man of Asia? This piece attacked China's financial markets, saying they may be more dangerous than, the Chinese, than China's wildlife markets. About China's battle against the virus, the, the article argues that the Wuhan government was secretive and self-serving. National authorities responded vigorously, but it, uh, it currently appears ineffectively. China's cities and factories were shutting down. The virus continues to spread. Well, in hindsight, this piece is quite an embarrassment, isn't it? It quickly became clear that China's response was effective, much more so than many other countries that uh, were more intent on criticizing China than preparing for their own outbreaks. 
Yes, China's factories shut down for a while. Yes, China's economy took a dip in the first quarter, a 6.8% slump, in fact, the steepest contraction in decades. But in quarter two, China's economy witnessed an equally steep rebound, growing 3.2% from a year earlier. More proof that hard work and sacrifice in the short term may pay off in the longer term. The opinion piece added that the most important longer-term outcome could appear to be a strengthening of the trend for global companies to de their supply chains. Add the continuing public health worries to the threat of the new trade wars and supply chain diversification begins to look prudent. But a, US, a recent U.S.-China Business Council 2020 member survey shows a quite different picture. It says that 91% of members say their China operations are profit, profitable. Nearly 70% are optimistic about the commercial prospects of the Chinese market. 87% said they have not moved or have no plans to move any operations outside of China. The uh, Wall Street Journal article significantly underestimated the resilience of the Chinese economy, thus making ludicrous predictions. It is true, some politicians are trumping, decoupling with China, even pushing companies who don't, or even punishing companies, I mean, who don't, or use subsidies to lure them back. But that's wishful thinking and clearly against the free market principles that capitalism is all about. When the Chinese market is the only economy to register positive growth when hit by an, a virus, who is really the sick man of the world? And then there was that much-hyped notion that COVID-19 was going to be China's Chernobyl moment. Remember that? We've seen so many examples and headlines of this uh, notion, different wording, but similar argument or questions that the COVID-19 outbreak could expose the incompetence of the Chinese leadership and its governance and that the legitimacy of the system based on economic prosperity would be greatly eroded and that the system would collapse. Just said what uh, happened after Chernobyl's nuclear accident to the former Soviet Union. Well, now clearly, the Chinese system has withstood the test and won recognition by its people, according to a global survey across 23 economies jointly conducted by a Singaporean social research agency and uh, an international online panel specialist in May. The Chinese mainland residents gave their government's response 85 out of 100, the highest in the world. Look at the number for the United States, for the UK, and for other countries. So may I ask, where is the Chernobyl moment? For whom was the Chernobyl moment? I have to be fair, though. There were people who gave China the benefit of the doubt, such as this one, an opinion piece published in the Financial Review in Australia on March the 2nd, which stood out. Written by the former Australian ambassador to China, Jeff Raby, the, the piece titled, Why COVID-19 is unlikely to be Xi's Chernobyl moment. The article of 19 could become China's symbolic Chernobyl, but at this stage it is too early into the cause of the disease to say much with any confidence. Obviously, a lot will depend on its severity and longevity and whether this leads to economic paralysis in China. This was an astute point, and as we see now, economic paralysis is far from the reality. The article also pointed out that uh, China today is not the Soviet Union of 1986. China is a highly successful, well-functioning economy that keeps delivering even higher material living standards to its citizens while its international standing is built on respect. And the article goes on to say, foreign commentators generally fail to recognize that support for the party is genuine and widespread. His assertions are backed up by yet another recent survey. Harvard's Kennedy School conducted surveys in China, which were collected over 13 years, which suggest that over 93% of Chinese people are satisfied with the central government. Many international polls in recent years also show that at least 90% of the Chinese people trust their government. Which other country enjoy that kind of high trust? Tell me. So the next time you read a piece predicting the fall of China, take a step back, think about these facts, and ask yourself, 
whether it is fear-mongering or whether it is a realistic question. And those who write, those who peddle the China collapse theory, please, just be a little bit more realistic and try to keep things in perspective, perspective and avoid making yourself a public embarrassment. We'll take a quick break and when we come back, I'll talk to my guests about the impact of these opinion pieces and why they've been so off from the reality looking back a few months later. Stay with me. Making sense of the overwhelming wave of information means cutting through the noise to shine a light on the heart of the story and making room for new perspectives. True understanding means the ability to see events from more than one side. I'm Liu Xin, and this is The Point. Hello and welcome back to this edition of Headline Buster, brought to you by me, Liu Xin. I have uh, with me pa four panelists. They are Dr. Eric Ding, Senior Fellow from the Federation of American Scientists, Dr. Hua Chen Zhu, Associate Professor with the State Key Laboratory of Emerging Infectious Diseases, the University of Hong Kong, <laughs> Brandon Blackburn Dwyer, President of Grasshopper Strategies, and Wang Song, a uh, Chief Reporter from Global Times. So uh, welcome to all of you. Um, I wonder what your thoughts are looking back at the past half year, let's say. It's, it's really been a roller coaster ride, and uh, it's actually quite emotional right for some people to look back and think about the early days of what we were going through sometimes it was really um, for me it is definitely emotional but uh, looking at some of these reports my emotions were mostly anger <laughs> okay let me go to Eric first Eric um, tell us why do you think we were seeing such fluctuation of emotions of opinions especially the overly pessimistic views about how China was handling this virus and how things will work out for China? Well, I always say the worse a scandal, the worse a calamity, the more people want to finger point and find a cause, find an explanation, because many people just do not want to accept that some things were random. And in terms of our pandemic response, the how well each country did, that certainly wasn't random. That is a function of leadership in many countries and the willingness for a uh, population to listen to science. But I think people are just grasping at trying to find, well, you know, we may have um, dropped the ball, screwed up our response in certain ways for this, but had someone else before not done that, then this never would have happened. So they always try to go back and find the root cause. and trying to find the root cause is oftentimes where the ugly finger pointing is because the further back we go, there's this fog of war and today we don't know where this virus is, but the finger pointing is only going to get worse and worse. Well, um, not very promising. <laughs> I thought when things slowly get back to normal or people start to understand the, the virus a bit better, maybe they become a bit more rational. And basically the reason why I want, we want to do this show is to really remind people that how irrational some of the commentary were in the early stage of the virus. Let me go to Dr. Ju. Uh, you are a scientist. We had a discussion at the early stage of the pandemic. Help us understand exactly what enabled China to bring the situation under control so fast. Is it because of the draconianness of it? Is it because of um, the, the effectiveness of the system, of the, the unity, the resilience of the Chinese people? What would you say? Uh, first, I have to admit that at the very beginning, we, uh, as uh, the scientists, uh, we kind of underestimate the virus, the impact of this COVID-19. So at that time, we think that we have all the experience uh, by handling the, uh, like, uh, the SARS and also the different kinds of influenza, even the pandemic outbreak uh, in year 2009. So we think that we have all the technology, science, and all the experience, we should be able to handle the COVID-19 in a very uh, nice way. So I, say, I would say that uh, actually in mid-January, when, uh, when we really 
realize that there are like hundreds of people getting infected. I'm also kind of like feeling angry and disappointed. But later on, when we realize this virus is nothing um, similar to anything that we have handled. So uh, we see that um, this virus is, is just like a uh, 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 transmitted in such a, a, a very fast way mm -hmm. and also so many people get infected and, and uh, people from different countries they all um, uh, been suffering from this virus we mm -hmm. realize that we are facing something completely new so when we're looking back at uh, the responses from the uh, Chinese people and the government I would say that uh, it is so impressive and it's so moved we, we, we are so grateful for the Wuhan people for their sacrificing their freedom for that short period of time. Okay. But I would say that when we talk about human rights, the, the right means that we need to live, to live happily, healthily and safely. Nowadays, we have already conquered this virus and we, our function has already started uh, to return back to normal. So it is so grateful for us to, to say a thank you to the Hubei people and also to our government. Absolutely, that sentiment definitely is shared by a lot of people here. Um, let me go to uh, Brandon. Brandon, I, wa I want to ask you this question. When you read or when you hear about these reports that are just dissected, what was your sentiment? Do you think these, these reporters or these commentators, they were doing their job properly? Because obviously some of the predictions that they were making or some of the things that they were trying to indicate were very much off the reality, you know, especially this talk about the Chernobyl moment um, clearly is very different between the two scenarios. So how do you look at the fact that there was a whole host of articles, writers, who were trying to make this analogy? Oh, I, I think let me take a piece of that question and talk about were they doing their job? Uh, commentators, columnists are paid to sell newspapers, to get clicks, to get audience engagement. These are not reporters. These are not people that are tasked with the truth per se. They are not tasked to uncover the history of everything. They are there to be the peanut gallery. They are there to add their voice. They, they're frankly there for discussion panels, to create engagement through analysis that is going to be wrong as much as it is right. And so to go back in time and to cherry pick and to say, hey, they got it wrong, this person got it right, and you yourself acknowledge some of the writers at the time got it right. Some of them were a little more optimistic about the way China was handling it. Some of them were very pessimistic. But in any event, large or small in the world, we have such a diversified media that you're always going to be able to cherry pick someone taking some very extreme opinion that somebody's going to agree with and somebody's going to absolutely hate. And unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your view on the media, that's what they're there for. So particularly the Chernobyl one was a, a, a metaphor that I believe was driven more by the success of HBO's series called Chernobyl that people were like, oh my God, I actually remember that happened. Maybe the rest of the world happened. And the series really creating a view that the fall of the Soviet Union was directly related to Chernobyl, which I, I also think is a bit of a false equivalency. Just five years later, the Soviet Union fell. Also, for the commentators that were saying, well, it's not Chernobyl in China because it's you know three months later and everything is fine, ignores the fact that it was five years later in the Soviet Union. Now, again, I don't think that's a great metaphor. I don't think it's a great uh, comparison. I think it was just popular media and one article caught everybody's attention and so a whole bunch of other people shoved it into their headlines so people would read their article as well. Okay, but all right. Well, we can really... Yeah, I, I get your point. You made, you made many interesting points. Let me go to Wang Tsong for his reaction and whether you agree with the fact that, you know, uh, opinion pieces, for instance, are just there for the, to create the engagement. I, I personally do believe there is an ethical part of it. There is a responsibility part of it because I write opinion pieces and I always have to, have to ask myself, you know, whether I'm being responsible, whether what I say, looking back a few months later in hindsight, I won't be so ashamed of what I said, you know, this is one thing. And secondly, whether we were cherry picking some of the more negative pieces to bust on this particular program. Okay, yeah, so for anybody who was following the initial stages of the outbreak in China, I think you, you would find it very easily that the overwhelming tone of that, uh, the media coverage 
is that it's you know uh, very negative, uh, very uh, very critical. Uh, I think there was no diversified opinions about uh, what was going on and what would happen. Uh, you you see that uh, I think from the uh, articles you picked, but it also the overall uh, tone and uh, overall narrative was that China was failing and that China was you know violating human rights. Uh, whatever China did was wrong. So that's the overall uh, I think takeaway for any I think many. Uh, millions of Chinese okay. people here that the foreign media was not fair. Right. I'm really running out of time. I want to squeeze in this comment in. Maybe, doc, uh, maybe Dr. Ju can react to that. Let's bring in the comment from Austin Diva. It says, you shouldn't have lied in the beginning and things could have been addressed more appropriately. All right, that's, I guess, a question addressed to Chinese uh, authorities, maybe uh, I don't know whether they're talking about local level or central government level. Dr. Ju, a tough one, but uh, would you like to react to that? Okay, I would say that uh, what really matters is how the people live in this land, how they feel. Uh, we are actually quite satisfied with the responses provided by the experts and, and also by the government. So we have successfully controlled this disease at least so far. So I think that um, uh, we are considering the uh, collective interest of this uh, whole country and people. So now we have done a good job. I think that is something that really matters, how these people feel about our resp uh, 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 response to this disease. So I think most of the Chinese All people, right. we are feeling quite satisfied and thankful. Yeah. Okay. We have to leave it there. Um, it's a never-ending discussion, I know, but time is very limited. Many thanks to the four guests, Eric Ding, Dr. Zhu Hua Chen, Brandon Blackburn Dwyer, and Wang Tsung. As usual, I thank my fellow uh, viewers. Thanks for watching. Go to my Twitter account, at uh, Lu Xin in Beijing, and follow me. Thanks. I hope you guys